Well, the Malays era of vehicles was certainly not a time that was known for vehicle performance. But one thing was true is that there was a number of luxury boats or land yachts that were produced during this Malays era. And for 1981, there was an awesome Malays Luxo boat. That's this 1981 Oldsmobile 98, which I must say is one of my favorite cars from this time period in automotive history. Now, the Olds 98, this so-called downsized Olds 98, it's funny to call it that because it was still 221 inches in overall length, riding atop a 119-inch wheelbase. That 221 inches, though, was downsized from the 1976 model year Olds 98 that was 232 inches in overall length and rode atop a 127-inch wheelbase. So this car was considerably smaller than the 1971 to 76 generation, but it was still large for sure. And it was large in charge. And unfortunately, by the 1981 model year, as was typical with vehicles during this time period, it was starting to lose some horsepower. So while you could still get an Olds 455 cubic inch V8 in that 1976 Olds 98, by 1981, There were only three engines that were available in these Olds 98s. Standard was a Buick-sourced 4.1-liter V6, which was effectively an enlarged 3.8-liter V6. And yes, that's a similar engine to what we all know and love, the Buick 3800. But I will say this Buick 4.1-liter wasn't that great of an engine. At this time, they had some issues with the lower ends and the oiling of them, and they really weren't the durable engines that they later became when the 3800 came out in the 1988 model year, which was an absolutely bulletproof engine. That 4.1 liter V6 in this 1981 Olds 98 made just 125 horsepower and 205 pound-feet of torque. So really not that much when it's trying to motivate a 4,000 plus 221 inch long vehicle, but that was a standard engine in 1981. Optional was an old-sourced 5-liter 307 cubic inch V8, made 145 horsepower and 240 pound-feet of torque. This would be the super common engine under hood in these Olds 98s and 88s, and even the Buick Electras, as well as the Buick LeSabres during this time period. Now, the Olds 307 was obviously not a big powerhouse, but one thing it was known for was its overall smoothness and reliability despite the sea of vacuum hoses that were under hood. They were really quite good engines. They didn't move the car with all that much speed, but they were smooth, they were durable, they were reliable. It was not uncommon to see one of these vehicles with the Olds 307 under hood with pushing, let's say, 200,000 miles on the clock. That was a pretty common sight. The V8s would last a good period of time. Unfortunately, behind the Olds 307, 1981 was the first year for the four-speed automatic with overdrive, the 200R4 transmission that was based on General Motors' turbohydromatic 200 transmission that first came out in the Chevette. Yes, I said that right. It first came out in the Chevette, and here it is in a full-size vehicle with an overdrive added to it. Well, In later years, those 200R4s would be somewhat reliable and would be behind a lot of different engines and used in many different vehicles, including Grand Nationals. But they just weren't nearly as durable as previous General Motors transmissions like the Turbohydromatic 350s and 400s, though they were better than the Turbohydromatic 200s that had come out a number of years before. As I mentioned, 1981 was the first year for this 200R4 four-speed overdrive transmission. And consequently, at least Oldsmobile gave you a little bit shorter rear-end ratios to get this car moving off the line. You got that 4.1 liter V6. It came standard with a 3.23 rear-end ratio, which was pretty short for one of these full-size cars. If you got the Olds 307 V8, it came standard with a 2.73 rear-end ratio, which was a little bit shorter than the 1980 models, which had a 241 rear end standard. But in 1980, there was just a three-speed automatic that was available. So presumably for fuel economy, Olds was trying to use a bit taller rear end ratio to get some better uh, gas mileage out of the vehicles. There is one more powertrain that was optional in 1981, and that was the Olds 5.7 liter diesel V8 
which I believe made around 105 horsepower in this year. Now, the diesel was introduced in the 1978 model year, and poor owners of those diesels, they had a number of reliability issues, including issues associated with the head bolts, the head gaskets, the injector pumps, water in the fuel. There was no water in its separator on those early diesels. Actually, the old diesel never got a water separator, amazingly, uh, despite the fact that especially during this time period, there was a lot of bad diesel fuel. So many of the buyers fell in love with the fact that they could get 25, in some cases close to 30 miles per gallon highway with that diesel underhood and a big full-size car, and they really did achieve that. I've owned a number of Olds diesel vehicles, but they did have some significant reliability issues and teething problems in the early years, and they also just had no power. Uh, you can imagine 105 horsepower in a 4,000-plus pound car. It was about... 17, 18 seconds, zero to 60. That is not a lie. So if you had to pass on a two-lane road, this was one of those vehicles where you were dropping back a little bit and then flooring it to gain some momentum to overtake the vehicle. Uh, otherwise, you just didn't have enough room. So needless to say, the powertrain choices available in this 81 Olds 98 were rather uninspiring, uh, especially when you compare it with the choices that were available, well, there really was only one choice in 1976, and that was the Olds 455 engine, which was a beautifully smooth runner. And though it was way down on horsepower in its final year, it still was just a great torque monster. And none of the engines that I mentioned, either the Buick 4.1, the Olds 307, or the Olds 350 diesel, really generated all that much torque in these vehicles. So they just didn't have that really that feel that you get when you drive a big block V8 where you're kind of pushed back in the seat just by torque. In any case, it was still a nice vehicle and a great cruiser with generally good fuel mileage. And on the exterior, the styling was revamped for the 1980 model year. The car came out in 1977, as I previously mentioned. But in 1980, they did make it a bit more boxy and gave the car a very upright, formal look to it, which I think is handsome, and it looks probably a little bit dated by today's standards, but hey, it looks different. My preference is actually for the Olds 88 styling, which had a little bit less formal roofline than the 98s. But the 98s have this overall formal style, and out back, as you can see here, they do have vertical taillights, a la Cadillac, which had been an Olds 98 trait for some time, all the way back to the early 1960s with a beautiful execution in particular on the 1963 Olds 98 where the tail light continues the overall rear quarter panel form. I must say that one exterior detail I find somewhat humorous on these Olds 98s is the optional cornering lights, which you can see here are very small in their overall shape compared with the cornering lights in particular on some of the 70s era Olds 98s. But I guess they didn't want to have the cornering light up high in the fender, and this was all the space that there was down low to execute it. And it works just fine on these vehicles, and cornering lights in general are actually quite helpful and still used on some upper-end vehicles to this day. One thing you do not get on any vehicle today, no matter the price, are seats like this. Notice this is this loose cushion look that really started with the 1972 Olds 98 Regency where interior designer Blaine Jenkins was given $100 by then Oldsmobile General Manager John Belts to dress up the Olds interior and make it a bit more fancy. And he came up with this loose cushion design that you can see was still employed here on the Olds 98s and would be even when the car switched to front-wheel drive in the 1985 model year, and this rear-wheel drive model would be sunset. But again, something you just can't find anymore, and these seats are supremely comfortable. And another thing that you can't find anymore, and it bugs the heck out of me, let me know if it bugs the heck out of you, is a nice, soft, cushy armrest. I have no idea why automakers today cannot put a soft armrest in the car for you to rest your right arm and elbow on. It's almost like they try to have the center console just be made of the hardest piece of black lava-like plastic and ensure that you're at least somewhat uncomfortable while you're driving the vehicle. 
If we flip the camera around, you'll see the dash of this 81 Olds 98, and it's very old school in a number of ways. You can see acres of fake plastic wood on the dash here, as well as the steering wheel. But, you know, it kind of looks good in that retro anachronistic type style. The dash on these is really not that long. The distance from the edge of the dash to the front window glass is pretty short. So you have this open, airy cabin feeling that helps give you a sense of greater roominess than in some cases the predecessors had. And you can see here that the vehicle has not only an AM-FM radio, but also the rolling numbers clock and Oldsmobile's Tempmatic automatic temperature control system, which was very different from the Comfortron systems that were employed on earlier models. The Tempmatic system enabled you to select the fan speed and also the mode door where the air would come out. That's what the top slider is. It really was a semi-automatic setup in that it only controlled the outlet temperature and not the fan speed or the mode doors, whereas Comfortron controlled everything. Some people liked this Tempmatic system better. Some thought it was just not as good. So it really depends upon what your preference was. The other thing you can see in this interior shot is Ohls's super large gas pedal that they had a reputation for dating back to the 60s. And this was really the last of the overly huge Oldsmobile gas pedals and the front wheel drive cars. They would just go to a common gas pedal. But Ohls actually had its own unique gas pedal during these years. And not quite sure why they felt that was a brand characteristic, but if you got the Buick, it was a different gas pedal from the Olds, from the Chevrolet and Pontiac. And the Olds one was, I think, at least uh, the largest and super cool. While there wasn't much power under hood, at least feels like you're commanding a lot of power from this engine room with this large of an accelerator. And here's a close-up of the climate control and radio buttons you can see there the Tempmatic. It says Tempmatic at the bottom right of the climate control. But you also notice an overall fan speed control and different settings with the top slider bar there. The bottom is for the temperature. But the top slider controls the mode door. Above the climate control and the clock are a bank of warning lights for various engine functions. There weren't many gauges on this car. Really, there was just the fuel gauge and everything else was idiot lights. And all the warning lights were in this bank here over on the right-hand side in the center of the vehicle. Kind of an odd placement out of the driver's field of view. Now, one unfortunate thing about these 80s-era General Motors vehicles, which this particular Oldsmobile does not seem to exhibit, that they often had droopy headliners after a period of time. I suspect this headliner's been replaced because they all droop. As opposed to the 70s-era vehicles where the headliner was stitched to roof bows, these vehicles use a one-piece headliner where the cloth is bonded to a foam, which is bonded, in some cases, to even cardboard. And what happens is over time, the foam degrades and then lets go, and the cloth basically just starts drooping, and there's nothing that you can do aside from replacing it. So that is something that is becoming a bit of a lost art. There aren't as many shops that do it anymore, and it's getting harder to find the fabric for the headliners. can still be available, but... In general, if you have a car that is a unique color, like a navy blue or a red or a chocolate brown, it's tougher to find that fabric now than just a neutral color like this tan or gray or something like that. So just something to be aware of if you buy one of those vehicles with a drooping headliner is that it can be challenging to get it replaced. And I would particularly stay away from 81 to 83 era Chrysler Imperials because they have that material on everything it seems like on the interior, not just the headliner, but they use that type of fabric on the B pillars and the A pillar trim and just throughout the entire vehicle. And last but not least, we'll close out this review of this 1981 Olds 98 with a view of the trunk. And yes, underneath that little tire cover, there is a space saver spare, if you can believe it. They did have those in these, unfortunately. But the overall trunk is about 20 cubic feet. It's enormous. It fits many different golf bags, dead bodies, whatever you want to put back there. Something that's sorely missing from any passenger car these days, and I think this is why a lot of people reverted to crossovers in addition to the fact that they like the higher seating height. But cars today just don't have a trunk at all. And in this, you could put 
a ton of stuff for a trip and you also had a lot of room on the inside and that's what makes these vehicles so great they're just wonderful touring vehicles and by this year they got pretty good gas mileage actually if you had an olds 307 equipped 1981 olds 98 you'd probably get 22 23 maybe even 24 miles per gallon on the freeway really not bad for what the car is and maybe that's why in addition to the interior and just the beautiful loose cushion seats that's why i like this 1981 Olds 98 so much. Hope you enjoyed this discussion of one of my favorite Malaysia luxury cars, the 1981 Olds 98. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you.